It was at that moment that I realised the sheer disconnect between the realities of my world and that of Thasia's. In that crossroads between genuine understanding and gross misinterpretations, did I finally get it. The SIOP manual had touched on it multiple times. The instructors at the IAS had hammered home the concept across several lectures. Yet it was only now that I began to viscerally understand the concept of fundamental systematic incongruence. To put it in a way that didn't sound like a scientist had gotten carried away with a thesaurus, all FSI was, was the idea of a world different enough to lack the ability to understand our own, but advanced enough that they'd have their own interpretations of it. It isn't just about a lack of skill or knowledge though, it's that a completely different knowledge system had already been formed, studied and developed into entrenched schools of thinking, entirely alien to our own. From there a sense of reality is derived that is as solid and concrete as the way we would understand our reality. It makes the explanation of something as simple as, say, a bomb, far more difficult than it would be to someone who simply didn't know what a bomb was to begin with. Because someone like Thaisia clearly understood the general concept and destructive potential of an explosive. Again, it wasn't so much that she didn't have that concept to begin with. If that were the case, then the whole situation would be as simple as laying down the foundations to an entirely new concept. The issue is that something similar enough already existed, so explaining the actual concept of a bomb would require upending existing beliefs and understanding. It'd be like me walking up to an engineering student in Harvard or Yale and telling them that a few magic spells could replace their high yield antimatter bomb. We both knew what an explosive was, however we ultimately had two very different entrenched approaches on how that explosive came to be, and how it even worked. This made explaining the severity of the situation to Thasia a potentially difficult prospect. Indeed, this set the precedent for just how difficult it would be to communicate anything I took for granted to the residents of the Nexus and the adjacent realms. So with that in mind, I took a deep breath as I prepared myself to bridge this gap in understanding. I'm afraid I don't quite follow Emma, Thasia responded to my warnings. Just how is it impossible for the foremost manipulators of manner in the Nexus to dispel a simple trap spell? You describe it as a bomb, and indeed we do have such weapons in our arsenal. However, no matter how clever or novel the artifice machinations may be, even they are susceptible to the same dispelling measures all academy graduates, let alone staff, are well versed in disabling. There it was. That massive gap in understanding. The effects of FSI on full display. I knew that hyperfixating on explaining the core mechanics of a bomb wouldn't work. It affects this one lapse in understanding but it wouldn't be addressing the core issue. I needed to pull the rug right out from under her. Thacia was smart, and I knew if I nudged her in the right direction, pointed her to see just how different our realities were, that she'd figure it out on her own. Thacia, I'm not sure how well I can explain this, but you remember how I told you that I need this suit to survive, right? That manner is dangerous and fundamentally incompatible to my kind? I began methodically causing the first of the cogs of realisation to turn in the avian's brain, her eyes sharpening with that same analytical gaze she's given me before. The implications of a truly manner deficient realm, leading to a species that had no innate abilities to deal with said manner, were starting to sink in. Are you saying that this device you speak of isn't a form of artifice trap or a trap spell? Thacia's voice hitched up, her eyes shifting back and forth as she was faced with the earth's shattering realisation of a society devoid of any manner-based sciences and technologies. But that, no. Then how would your armour, your luggage, your civilised tendencies and your knowledge of inter-realm communications, that, those just can't. She took a moment to compose herself, her feathers puffing up as she did so. I gave her a moment to think about the ramifications of this realisation. It took a solid minute as she shuddered in place, her plumage causing her cloak to rise up and fall in rapid succession. Her eyes ravaged by whatever thought processes were going inside of that avian mind. Without warning, she reached her hand to touch my armour, traced her fingers up and down my chest plate, my shoulder pads and even my gauntlets. Her fingers reached over to tap my tinted lenses as if to reinforce whatever reality check she was currently going through. Am I correct in assuming that none of this, not a single piece of mostly forged metal was born from artifice hands? That these immaculate glass pieces weren't blown from mana breath blowers? That the forging process itself wasn't derived from mana powered implements or equipment? Or any mana based methodologies? That. that this. this metal was forged using the same techniques as a primitive backwater town's blacksmith, lacking any modern implements? 
she asked with a voice that was surprisingly composed for someone going through a reality-altering realisation. Though it was very much far more emotive than the nonplussed, lofty royal inflections she used back in the Grand Hall. That's right, I began, deciding to take the princess's passing remark as a jumping off point. I assume you guys are blacksmiths that don't use any magic or mana infused, mana based equipment, right? Yes, hence why I brought this up given how it's physically impossible to craft something so advanced without the use of mana. Alright, I quickly interjected, before the princess could trail off any further. I want you to imagine a society. A civilization that never stopped doing that. I paused for a moment to grab my tablet, and had the EV run through the cultural exchange database for the images I needed to illustrate my point. We started from the same primitive origins. Yeah, but we didn't have any mana, or any of this magic stuff to work with, so we improvised. The image on screen started off with a primitive backwater forge Thasia had probably conjured up in her headspace, before it moved to more advanced metalworking techniques. Larger blowers, more manpower poured into the art of metallurgy. Brute forcing it was one way, but we discovered we could do better by learning about the fundamental principles behind it. First by trial and error and experimentation. Then, gradually, painstakingly and over a great amount of time, we slowly but surely built up our understanding on the subject using the scientific method. The pictures move fast. From old metalworking workshops from the Middle Ages, all the way through to the Industrial Revolution, where factories and foundries containing massive crucibles filled with molten metal sat in endless rows at the height of the pre-automated era industrial scale mass production. We advanced not with the help of your invisible and untouchable manner, but by using the principles we learned that govern the world, and using them to our advantage. The images move quicker still, through the world wars, with foundries and assembly plants forging larger and larger pieces of iron and steel, piecing together trucks and battleships alike. The images continued up to the 21st century with large-scale industrial production that became increasingly more advanced with the advent of automation and computer-assisted systems, before finally landing on a factory packed to the brim with CNC machines of varying sizes and makes. You see, Thasia, it took us thousands of years before we got to where I am. The armor you see me wearing is the culmination of thousands of generations of blood, sweat and toil. I wear the legacy of a million scientists, engineers, forge workers, technicians and miners, I carry their legacy on my shoulders with every minute of my existence here at the Nexus. Your little small town blacksmith? Well, we were once them. The only discernible difference being we have the benefit of the knowledge garnered by millennia of human tenacity and innovation, all done without the aid and shortcuts manna seems to afford. I finished off that explanation with a strong sense of pride in my voice. Thasia didn't even look or flinch away once as she went starry-eyed at the tablet in front of her. In fact... Her eyes seemed to have adapted quickly to the blinding light of the device, unlike Eleanor. I knew that a lot of it went over her head. It would take weeks upon weeks to fully explain every little aspect of each photo to her. In fact, I knew that the more modern the picture was, the longer it would take for me to carefully point and elaborate on every single object seen within the pictures. That's why I stopped at the late 21st century, prior to the advent of truly stellar scale mass production and industrial processes. I didn't need to explain everything just yet. I just needed to prove a point, and that blacksmith was a jumping off point that was too good to pass up. I... I am... I am going to assume then that, that this trap, this bomb of yours, is formed on the same manner deficient principles. That you managed to construct such a violent weapon without the aid or enrichment of mana? Thaisa concluded, her voice bordering between disbelief and a dour severity. Precisely. And there were a few solid moments of silence that followed, as the princess moved wordlessly towards one of the couches in the room, and sat on it with a slow, practiced movement. She gestured for me to follow, which I did, as I took the seat in front of her, and another spike of radiation hit me. Alert! Localized surge of mana radiation detected. 225% above background radiation levels. It was clear that the princess was becoming quite used to making sure the seats I parked myself at were safe from my massive weight. This would mean that the Academy staff have no recourse in the dispelling of this destructive device. This bomb of yours, Thaisa continued, her eyes now filling up with the same worry that I currently felt as the ramifications of this threat grew further and further. They wouldn't even have a means of detecting it if it runs on... Um, what? Fire? Thaisa struggled to finish that train of thought. Perhaps for the first time in her life she couldn't find a proper analogue for a principle she thought she understood. No gunpowder... No traditional form of explosive to pull from. It's a complex mixture of several chemicals derived from synthetic processes, I began, 
as I actively try to ignore the Eevee's attempts at pulling up the encyclopedia page for this incendiary infused explosive. The stupid thing was thinking I was looking to recite the device's entire mechanism verbatim. The chemicals are mixed and prepared in such a way that it remains stable, even when you kick it or hit it really, really hard. The only way to activate it is using a very specific device that is designed to make it explode. That same device is counting down towards a time where it will explode. It also has the ability to determine if the box is being forcibly opened, in which case it will also explode. And yes, none of this is mana derived, I reiterated, as Thasia's expression continued to shift between utter shock and serious concern. Chemicals, Thasia mined back. Mixing, preparing, she continued. Is this some perverse mana deficient alchemy? Again, she was grasping at straws and comparing it to what she knew, which was to be expected. Yes, sort of. Roughly. I guess it's superficially similar, yeah. Thacia's gaze pierced through my lenses again. This time, however, it was clear she understood what was at stake. Emma, as much as this goes against social conventions, I believe the situation you find yourself in is unorthodox enough that it warrants unconventional solutions. I approve if you wish to try to get your luggage back. However, understand that it may not be possible, especially at this hour. I, I suggest we try first thing in the morning, after breakfast, Thacia offered. The cognitive dissonance and logical disconnect I felt at that plan was absolute whiplash. It was clear she understood what was at stake now. Heck, she even stated it outright. The fact that she wanted to wait this out just didn't click with me. In the morning? Thacia, whoever took the damn containers could be working on Prime Open as we speak. We're risking someone getting seriously hurt, or worse, if we don't do something about this now, I shot back. Emma, I understand the severity of the situation. However, you will find it physically impossible to leave after curfew. Thacia answered back sternly, without anything else mudding her tone of voice. She was giving it to me straight. There are measures to keep students from leaving their dormitories, especially during this five-day grace period. In addition to this, I can assure you that no one will be attempting to access the contents of your box at this hour. It's tradition after the binding ritual to maintain vigil and recite powerful spells on the Book of Names throughout the entirety of the night to ensure that the desired effects of soul binding takes effect. In addition, I'm more than certain that due to the presence of two anomalous names in the book, yours and my own, that the process will be deliberated and drawn far beyond what is to be expected. Emma, the avia paused, making sure to emphasize that point by maintaining unflinching eye contact with me throughout the opaque lenses. You must trust me and compromise with me on this particular matter. I am certain that we will have time. It will be more detrimental if you try to leave now than wait seven hours before curfew is over at dawn. With a solemn sigh and an attempt at a smile, the princess shifted gears back into an attempt at empathetic connection. This night has been hard on all of us. I do not want to see you breaking on day one of the academy before classes have even begun. Now, I do not know much about your kind, but if you're like the rest of us, you need your sleep. So please. Thacia practically pleaded with a mouthful of coos and whirs, ending off her speech. I remained silent, giving the princess's words genuine consideration. She was the only reliable source of intel I had on how best to move forward with any sort of operation I wanted to conduct within the academy. The name of the game for my mission was Long Term Recon, bordering on infiltration. I needed to extract as much as I could from this whole lone New Roma Canada quest the Nexus had vaguely demanded of Earth. Making friends along the way, and connections to those near the top of the pecking order of both the Nexus and the adjacent realms was a bonus. Gunnering long term assets and allies was something I didn't see myself accomplishing until much later, but as it turns out, connections are just as important here as they were back at home. Going in guns blazing, rampaging through the halls and sneaking through uncharted and potentially hostile territory was something that would endanger the entire mission. I had to give Thacia's suggestions a shot. I took a few moments to consider my options. It was at that point that I finally noticed the 10 push notifications from my Eevee, as it threatened to flood a good chunk of my heart with its incessant messages. What is it? I asked the program, making sure that my voice was again cut off on the outside world. As per your previous command, I have isolated four unique instances of intentional interference and one unique instance of conspiracy to theft. I have marked these files on your pending priorities folder for review and further deliberation. The Eevee responded in that same no-nonsense passive-aggressive tone of voice. Without much fanfare and with the enthusiasm of a vacationer ready to claim the biannual ticket drop for a trip to Alpha Centauri, I instantly opened the folder on my tablet, going through each of the four unique instances mentioned by the Eevee. The video feed was cut, edited and highlighted, 
to display each suspect interaction between the members of the Academy's faculty and my containers. The footage started the moment the crates found themselves finally flung against the walls of some unknown dungeon-like room after exiting the portal. It continued, showing each of the nine containers being poked and prodded by the likes of several unknown members of staff, with container 10 always in view of each and every cut of footage. It was a level of suspicion and curiosity that I had more or less expected from the Academy, and honestly if they had left it at that I wouldn't be that annoyed by it. Yet as the video continued on, it was clear that they had some unexplained fixation on container 10. It was after a full 10 minutes of footage did I finally move to the file mart Conspiracy to Theft. This one file had perhaps the most damning evidence of all, and in fact confirmed all of my suspicions in addition to Thasia's own predictions. I quickly shot a glance at Thasia, as I turned the tablet around for the both of us to view. Thasia, I began, you need to take a look at this. Her avian eyes locked onto my screen as it began playing the footage that showed container 10 in plain sight. Three figures stood next to it, with another figure in the far upper right of the screen hidden from view, but clad in a signature blue robe. Whilst the identity of the figure hidden from view was to be decided, the three figures currently in view and collectively staring at the container was undeniably the black robed Maltori, the female elf from a half hour prior, and her armor clad gargoyle. I would have preferred to study everything, however it is clear that the Earth Roma has a tenacious penchant for independence. Removing more than a few of her belongings would more than likely trigger a violent reaction, befitting of her less than enlightened primitive tendencies. Such is the nature of the New Realmers, Maltori unabashedly announced causing my blood to begin simmering once again. They are territorial, bloodthirsty, and they act more like a pack of wild animals laying claim to land and property, like the unruly dragons of the realm. As such, I deem it wise to remove only one item from her strange collection of eclectic boxes. Matori pointed towards container 10, and not once made contact with the box, relying solely on the female elf and the gargoyle to shuffle and move it around. Professor, this is outrageous. An unseen voice uttered from off-camera. The same voice belonging to the blue robe professor. You're acting like a savage pillager. Please, let us be sensible. If you wish to study her anomalous belongings, then wait until the morning to request it such. To take them and to have your apprentice explain it away as a bald-faced lie is unbecoming of a man of your titles. Vanavan. Martori interjected with a seething, cold annoyance. I am doing this for your dean. A message must be sent to the Earth Realm where that concessions must be made for insubordinate actions against us. Given your lack of a spine, it is clear that I am the only one to be capable of shouldering this responsibility. Professor, listen to me. You know as well as I the ramifications of the Earthrunner's mere presence here. She should not be able to walk amongst her own, and yet she does so with ease and indifference. We have seen the existence of an Oldfielder, a Manalus, a Norlus capable of feats of craftsmanship that shouldn't be possible. Considering the ramifications of a society behind the portal that is capable of such a feat without the aid of mana... Silence! Matori shot back losing his temperament for a split second before pulling himself together in the same ambivalent fashion. Your fear blinds you, Vanavan. Your lack of initiative further hobbles you. If you fear the Earth Realm was so much for his anomalous existence, then work with me to understand it. Further, consider this possibility. How likely is it that a world lacking manner is capable of such feats? Understand a convention just should not be possible. They should be fleeing sticks and stones like barbarians, or trapped in the early Iron Age in small towns and villages, Vanavan answered. Then entertain this hypothesis. Is it, or is it not possible, that another realm, or another magical patron, has bestowed upon the Earth Realmers the gifts of advanced manner artificing? That they are but a race of spoiled children, or the pawns of some greater force working to undermine the Nexus, and all we stand for? Is it not more likely that the existence of a completely mannerless society, creating such wonders... Maltoy professed, which prompted Vanavan to go entirely silent. Consider that fact, Vanavan. Consider it with great severity. The Earth Romans may simply be the scouts for another unknown power, which threatens the integrity of the Nexus and the adjacent realms. I have no doubt in my mind that they are mindless savage pawns, dressed up to confuse and to throw us off. There is no possibility that a civilization lacking manner is capable of any of these feats. It felt to me like Maltori was pushing further and further into his own delusions, as the rest of the containers were slowly carted off, meaning the camera was being carted off as well. I still don't think this is the best way to move forward, Professor. However, we have more pressing matters to attend to. The binding ceremonies follow-up rituals are already underway. 
Considering the Tainted One and the Earthrammer, this might take us a night or two to complete, Fenerman spoke, just as the footage cut off. The rest of the containers and the camera filming the scene, being carted off to a set of familiar halls. Thaisia turned to me with an expression that was very much becoming the theme of the entire night, one fraught with concern but blanketed by our general look of exhaustion. I am going to assume that this is yet another one of your manner deficient artifices, meant to hold moving images and sounds? Yes. The avian took a deep breath, her exhale generating a small melody in the process. I will also assume that these are accurate memory shards of the events preceding the arrival of your luggage to the room. Yes. Another deep inhale and exhale punctuated the silence between Thasia's response. It is clear that we have sufficient evidence to support our assumptions now. Your luggage has indeed been taken, and the aims of the seizure of property is both political and practical. It is likewise clear, however, that the faculty will be preoccupied for the entirety of this night and the following night. As a result of this, my point stands, Emma. With an affirming nod of understanding, I finally gave in and acquiesced. You're right. Let's get this whole operation on the road first thing in the morning, then.